Good morning and welcome to Grace on this wonderful 4th of July weekend. Hope you've had a great day and you're looking forward to worshiping together. We're glad you're here with us this morning. Just a few brief announcements today. The church office is closed tomorrow, so make sure you're aware of that if you're trying to reach somebody. Ladies and girls, the uh, Children at the Lake is this Thursday night. This is the last Sunday to sign up for that. So you want to make sure you sign up in the church lobby. It's $5. You can take care of that. But uh, we want to make sure you know about that and you can get out there. It'll be a great time of fellowship. Next Saturday is Churchwide Outreach, 930. We'll meet in the Hanson. Uh, so make sure you're planning to be there. And, of course, next Sunday is our Beat the Heat Sunday, kick off the VBS week. Uh, to next Sunday, parents, drop off your children in the Shumpert Chapel. We'll be starting at 9.30 there, so Sunday schools won't be in their regular spot. They'll meet all together in the Shumpert. And then after the service, you'll pick up on Kelly Field. Uh, so please make sure you know we have plans for them to get wet. And so dress appropriately for that. Uh, don't come in your Sunday best for next Sunday for the kids for that. There is no PM service next Sunday evening, July 10th, so make sure you're making plans for that. Uh, use that time. Pastor will talk to you a little bit about that fellowship. VBS gets kicked off that week, so VBS workers, Pastor Colton would like to meet with you just briefly tonight after the service in the Hanson. Uh, so that's VBS workers, and then VBS is July 11th through the 14th in the morning, 8.30 to 11.30. Uh, you can register online or at the kiosks. One more thing to be planning for coming up July 23rd. This is Saturday on July 23rd. We have a volunteer summer choir uh, that's made up of choir members from our church choir, school choir. We've got a wonderful concert that we've been working on, about 10 songs. You want to plan to come. It'll be an encouraging night, a, a fun night, as we sing songs about our Savior, rejoice and worship in Him. It'll be in the Shumpert. Uh, there'll be more details coming out, but I want to go ahead and mark that on your calendar. Come and enjoy an evening of sacred music, encouraging each other and worshiping our Lord. And we do have another video for VBS we're going to show in a couple seconds. But right before that, I want to make you aware the next two Sundays, things will be a little bit different. Um, usually on our fifth Sunday, that's when we have our dinner on the grounds. We'll have a lunch here, a little picnic lunch with, with everybody and have this inspiration. But because of Beat the Heat Sunday, uh, we're, we're going to have this time, we're going to switch around on the 31st. We're, we're going to have regular services on the 31st. So some of you may have thought, okay, on the 31st, that's when we come, we have lunch in the evening. But on the 31st, we're going to have regular services, Sunday school, church, and then evening service. Next Sunday, July 10th, we are going, because of Beat the Heat, um, because we have folks who will be out there working, a large uh, portion of our ministry will be out there working, working in the heat and doing different things. We are going to do things a little bit differently, take Sunday night off. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I can't make you do it. There's no, there's no sign-up sheet. Uh, there's no official thing, but I want to encourage you to take that opportunity that Sunday evening to spend some time in fellowship with some other folks at Grace Baptist Church. So if you have, and I say, well, Pastor Gover, I just saw him at Beat the Heat. There's plenty of fellowship. When, whenever there's a church activity going on, there's always usually something that you have to do. You have to be supervising or something like that. But let me encourage you. Uh, maybe some of you that have the ability, maybe to have a few folks over at the house, uh, maybe there, or maybe meet somewhere at a restaurant, but, but spend some time. And let me encourage you to spend some time with some folks that you know and invite some folks that maybe that you don't know. And, uh, and just in, invite, we've got a lot of new faces here, a lot of people that are coming and visiting after church this morning. Walk around. Find, you don't have a long time. It's next Sunday night. But walk around, invite, encourage people to be a part of that. And I pray that you'll do that and take advantage of that time on Sunday night. And then want to let you know on Sunday morning, July 17th, uh, that'll be the last um, uh, time that Pastor Bill and Miss Vicki will be here. Uh, they believe that the Lord would have them live in closer proximity to their grandkids. And there was a time in my life when I would not understand that. But honestly, now that I have a grandkid, I'm surprised that they've been here this long. I, I would have uh, thought they would have scooted out immediately uh, to get to Florida and Tennessee so they could be with the grandkids. But they will be uh, moving officially uh, later that week. And, and doing that, I've asked Pastor Bill if he would preach for us there on July 17th. So that Sunday morning, I'm going to have Pastor Bill preach and... Uh, that they will be here and you'll be able to say, you know, hey to them. And they're, they're going to be moving to Florida and Tennessee. I'm sure they'll stop by and there are many travels every once in a while. And you get to see him again, but want to give you a chance to make sure that uh, you know that that'll, he'll be preaching. There'll be a special Sunday that Sunday. All right. So if you'll give your attention to the screens, we want our, our young people to uh, find out some more about our VBS coming up. God of Wonders. 
Hey, boys and girls, Mr. Josh here, and I get to give the VBS announcement this week. You've got one week to sign up. We're starting next Sunday, and then we'll continue next Monday, Tuesday, thir Wednesday, Thursday in the morning. So come out. VBS is my favorite time of the year because it is amazing. Hey. Josh. Well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about VBS. It is the best week when you're a kid. VBS. What does VBS stand for? Hey, stand I don't really know. I got you. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Vicious Bible Stories. Vicious Bible That's awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited about that. That sounds cool. I cannot wait for that. Like John the Baptist when he got his head chopped off. Dude, that's kind of gruesome. But it's vicious. That's true. What about the Ten Plagues? Oh. I love the Ten Plagues of Moses in the children of Israel. Yep. Ten Plagues work. Ten Plagues. And you know what my favorite plague is? Okay. I do. Number two. Number two. You got a frog in your pocket, Josh? Shh. Hey, what about the story about the scrawny kid who took the smooth stone and he flinged it over his head toward the Goliath? Toward the Goliath? That's awesome. Dude, that's not what killed him. A lot of people say that's what killed him. That is not what killed him. What killed him was when David went up, grabbed Goliath's sword out, pulled it out, and chopped his head off and held it up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Hey, guys, what are you talking about? We're talking about VBS. VBS? VBS? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, like Vacation Bible School? Man, I can't right, wait right, for Vacation right, Bible no, School. No, 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 no. We're talking about VBS. Yeah. Vicious Bible Stories. Vicious Bible stories? Absolutely. Yes. That's what you guys want to call it? Yes. yes! Guys, you can't just throw out decades of tradition and call it vicious Bible stories. Well, what do you want to call it? Yeah. I, I don't know. Think of something else. We're not calling it vicious Bible hey. stories. We got young kids coming. Okay, okay, but you can't take vacation and school and put it together. That's uh, two completely okay. different now, things. I, I guess I see that. You know what? If you guys can come up with a better acronym. We got it. We got it. Okay, I'm all ears. Tell me. Well, um, first of all, we got to have fun. Yes. Okay, I see I that. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Fun. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, inspirational. 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 That's inspirational. I mean, I, have, yeah, I guess. I, I, yeah. When, when David has the strength to do that, okay. that's inspirational. Yeah, sure. I can do sure. that. What about, I'll take what about it. fun, inspirational, neato? Neato? Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of neato. Kinda. Neato. Kinda. Kinda. Sort of school, because yeah. you're learning a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So fun, inspirational, yeah, yeah. neato, kinda. Yeah. Sort of school. Sort of school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. right. Yep, that's so it. you we guys. Wait, wait, wait. So you guys want to call it Finks? Yeah. Why not? Hey, hey. Let me think so. Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. You guys are gonna have to come up with something else. Me thinks you're not our boss. Well, me thinks that I am, so you better come up with something else. Me thinks we might need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, yeah. okay. Whatever you wanna call it. If you wanna call it VBS, you wanna call it Finks, hopefully not. We've got one more week for you guys to sign up. Next Sunday, we're starting our Beat the Heat Sunday out at Kelly Field, and you guys are not going to want to miss that. Monday through Thursday morning, we're going to have our VBS God of Wonders theme. So make sure, if you are coming, to sign up this week. We're looking forward to it. Because if you don't, me thinks you're running out of time. Me yeah. thinks you better do it now. Speechless. Holy is He is going to be our song for the month. And let's stand and let's sing it together. Hopefully, you remember it well. Holy is He, and uh, we'll have a good time singing it together.
morning. We look forward to the day when we get to worship your holiness in the beauty of holiness. Lord, we're so, so separated from you right now by our sin, by our humanity. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son on the cross. We thank you that you have counted us redeemed, that you have justified us and placed us legally and, and, and fully in your presence because of the gift of your son. Lord, we are so thankful for that, but our heart longs for the day. Lord, when our faith becomes sight. Lord, when we can see you face to face and understand, Lord, for the first time, just how glorious and how beautiful you are in your holiness. Lord, I pray that today we would not go through the activity of church. But Lord, as we think on your holiness, that we would remember Lord, what Peter told us and remind us of what Moses said. Lord, because of your holiness, we are to be holy. And Lord, you've raised us up, made us a royal priesthood, made us a peculiar generation. You've changed us from the folks that we work with, from the folks that live in our neighborhood. You, you've bought us out of the slave market of sin. You've given us a purpose and a reason to live. Lord, it's because of your holiness, and your righteousness, your mercy, and your goodness. Lord, I pray that today you'd continue to peel back the veil just a little bit. Lord, help us to see you. Lord, help us to forget the things going on in our life, forget the distractions that would keep us from worshiping you. Lord, help us not to think about anything but you as we sing your praises, as we look into your word, as we listen to your truth. And then, Lord, I pray that we would go out changed, ready to make a difference in this world around us. Well, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being a God that sent his son so that we can know you, but for being a God that truly is unknowable. Lord, man could not have come up with the person that you are. Man could not have, have formed that in his wildest imagination. Lord, your holiness is great. Your love is majestic. I thank you for that, and I pray that today you would change us as we worship. Lord, we do pray for the many folks that can't be here, Lord, because of illness and because of sickness. Lord, we ask that you would wrap your arms around them and encourage them as they worship from afar. Lord, I pray that they too would be overwhelmed and be able to truly sing and rejoice in the fact that you are holy. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Christ's precious name, amen.
Let's stand, let's sing together. He will hold me fast. That's who we're talking about, that holy God will hold us fast. Let's stand, let's sing it together. He will hold me fast.
Our scripture reading this morning is in Romans chapter 7. Uh, pastor has been preaching through the book of Galatians. And as you know, a lot of the, the book is about the relationship between God's grace and the law. And so while this is in Galatians, this passage in Romans chapter 7, Paul deals with that same exact subject, how God's law relates to his grace. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up there to Romans 7. We're just going to read the first 12 verses. Romans 7, verses 1 through 12. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then... If while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's stand, let's sing together a verse. If he keeps me singing, we'll have the choir and orchestra. You guys can go ahead and head on down now. Head down, and after we sing the verse, young people, you can head off to junior church. There's within my heart.
men, please have a seat. Anne's going to come and sing for us. Comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need. Yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. And we cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through? it takes to know you're near and what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise when friends betray us when darkness seems to win we know the pain reminds this heart that this It's not our home. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is a revealing of a greater thirst this world can satisfy? And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights, are your mercies in disguise? Amen. It's a wonderful thing to be reminded that this world is not our home. Amen. And thankful that we are just passing through. Take your Bibles, turn them to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. As we continue our study in Galatians, I know, or I believe, I sincerely believe that there are some that are seated out here this morning that say, all right, we get it. We get it. You can't follow lists. You've got to follow the Holy Spirit. We get it. Don't try to perfect. Don't try to help God out. We, we get this. Can we be done? Well, 
I would encourage you, we're in Galatians 3. Not 4, not 5, not 6. We're not done yet. And as we're going through and as we're looking at this, it's important that we unpack and that we understand exactly what is happening. Now, we're not going to go and unpack everything, but we talked very doctrinally about how God made the promise to Abraham that that promise came through Christ, and that is exactly what we rely on as Christians. But the reason why Paul is taking this, it's interesting, because Paul says there in Romans, I write to you that know the law. And that's what we read for our scripture reading. You'd say, well, the church at Rome is not primarily, we would expect Paul to say something like, I know I'm writing the law to those that know the law, to people who were in Jerusalem, because the Jews would know the law. You say, well, why was Paul so confident? Well, because this is one of the problems that we have as Christians, is finding the balance between understanding what God is teaching and applying what God is teaching. And it's very, very difficult at times. You see, both covenants, the Old Testament and the New Testament, both covenants were covenants of faith. You need to understand the Old Testament covenant was not a deal of works. If Israel could do everything, then Israel would be fine. And Israel didn't do everything, so Israel wasn't fine. That's why they had to have the new covenant. No, the old covenant was exactly what God intended it to be. It was a covenant where they were supposed to place their faith and trust in the God of heaven. And as a result of that, they were supposed to do his works. But what the children of Israel did is they took those works, and instead of that being the guideline for their life, they turned it from the guideline into the staircase to ascend into the heavens. And they made those works the thing that was important. And it got to the point where God in the Old Testament said, I despise your feast days. And I don't know about you, but today, as we sang holy, 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 and I began to think on the God of wonders that's coming up in our VBS and began to think on who he is and began to worship him, it would horrify for me to think that our worship, that our choirs, they sing in God we trust in God alone. It would horrify me to think that God would sit in heaven and say, I hate, I despise the church services at Grace Baptist Church. I hope you would do. I, I hope that you would not sit there and say, well, as long as everything looked okay and sounded okay, I think we should be fine with it. No, no, we don't come here for us. We come here to worship God and for him to say to the children of Israel, I hate your feast days. I've had enough for your praying. I've had enough of your sacrificing. I've had enough of all your holy days. Enough of that. I don't want that. What did he say? He said, I want your heart. He said, you're so careful about keeping your laws. He said, I, I, don't, don't just worry about circumcising yourself. Circumcise your heart. I want you. But the battle with that is that as Christians, we struggle with the difference between the reality of what God has done and what it looks like. You see, we are reduced to seeing what's on the outside. God can look on our heart. You and I can't look on anybody's heart but our own. You can't look on your wife's heart. You can't look on your children's heart. Boy, we try sometimes. But how are we supposed to know what's going on in the heart? Because it's such a difficult thing. In James, this, this obedience that is so necessary, James lays out and says, listen, this, this is intrinsic to salvation. It's not that works accomplish salvation, but salvation accomplishes works. He says in James chapter 2, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. What James is saying, and this caused a lot of problems for a lot of folks. They say, well, man, James, James says it doesn't matter what you do. No, no, that's not what he's saying. James isn't saying you have to earn your salvation. He's saying the Bible tells us that Abraham believed and he was justified. And because Abraham believed, Abraham was fine with sacrificing. And we looked at that last week. Abraham hadn't read Hebrews yet. He hadn't read the end of Genesis. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he took Isaac, and as he took Isaac up, he knew the promise. The promise was God was going to give him many offspring. Like the stars in the sky, I, Abraham looked out, looked up, saw it, and he believed, and God counted it to him for righteousness. And Hebrews tells us as Abraham was walking up the mountain, he was so clinging to that promise that Abraham made up something 
that no one had ever heard of before. Do you remember? He said, we're going up. He just assumed that if he sacrificed Isaac, what was God going to do? Raise him from the dead. Because, well, like it always happened back then, right? Who did Abraham hear that story from? He hadn't read the New Testament yet. In fact, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the Old Testament prophets had no clue what the eventual plan was. They were researching and looking and, and trying to find it, but they didn't know. And Abraham was like, well, God, God obviously promised, and he believed him so much that he thought, well, obviously he's going he's to raise him from the dead. And then he got up there, he picked up the knife, and God said, no, don't kill him, and gave him a ram over in the thicket. And Abraham went, oh, okay, that'll work. It wasn't Abraham going up saying, okay, I've got to prove myself. But that's where it gets so difficult. And that's why Paul brings this in. I want to try to, to help cement it more in your mind because it's so difficult. How do we as parents who are in love with the Lord and trying to serve the Lord, how do we teach our children to love the Lord, not to just do stuff? And how do we teach them that the stuff that we do is important, not because of what we do, but because of the heart that it flows out of? And it's so difficult, so we have to be careful. We have to be careful how we preach and teach, how we understand, how we move forward with this teaching. So in Galatians 3.18, we're going to walk through these verses. You're probably going to hear some things that uh, you haven't heard in a long time. I hope you don't, haven't heard anything that you haven't heard before. You should have heard all of this before, but bringing it together will help you understand the argument that Paul makes. Because here's what has happened. Paul has made a defense that the law does not save. So then the natural question is, well, then what's the point of the law? Basically, if they're being taught this, they're saying, why are we learning this? I don't see how this is going to be. Why would God have any law? He's going to answer that question. So let's have a word of prayer and we will jump in this morning. Lord, bless this time. Lord, speak through me. Lord, help us to understand your word and Lord, unlock our understanding. Lord, help us to see you. Lord, there are so many people who play at Christianity, especially within our culture. Lord, you have separated us as kings and priests. Lord, help us to live as kings and priests, the way you've ordained for us to live. Lord, give us wisdom, give us direction. And Lord, I pray that you would reveal, if there's someone here who has been playing at religion, they have that form of godliness, but no power of you in their life. Lord, awaken them to their need of salvation. Thank you. We love you. In the name of Christ, amen. Look at verse 18, Galatians 3. Paul says, if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he has already said the inheritance, we get what we're, this salvation does not come by law. It becomes of the grace gift to Abraham. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Paul asked the question, so what was the point? Why did we go through all of this if there was no point? Why did we have all of these centuries of law if it was useless? Paul says, Why, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Now we're going to look at that in a couple minutes. Because that could mean it was added because there were transgressions or it was added to increase transgressions. We'll look at that. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. We talked about that two weeks ago. Who was the seed promised to? Seed was promised to Abraham. Who was the seed that was to come promised to? A specific seed that was going to come that was going to reign forever. That was promised to David. And the specific seed we know to be Jesus Christ, Messiah. So we know that this law was going to reign until the promise came to take care of what God had sent to Abraham. Then look at that phrase. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now to our mind, this is something that many folks outside of the Jewish belief do not understand. We have a picture of how the law came. And maybe this is because of what you've seen and, I don't know, on movies or on flannel graph or something. But when Paul talks about this law coming by angels, some folks get a little confused. But I want to remind you of some things. Now, Stephen, early church in Jerusalem in Acts 7.53, he said, we've received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Stephen, in talking to other Jews there in Jerusalem said, angels gave us this law, but we haven't kept it. The writer of Hebrews, and the writer of Hebrews specifically addresses Hebrew believers. 
So he's writing to folks who know and understand the Hebrew uh, culture, know and understand the Hebrew faith, the Hebrew belief. He says in verse 2 of chapter 2, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, the word spoken by angels. Now some of you may be confused. What is he talking about? Well, go to Deuteronomy. We'll put it up there. You don't have to turn there, but we'll put it up there. Go to Deuteronomy 33.2. The Bible says, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. What Jews understood, what people, the Judaizers understood, everybody realized that the Old Testament law, we have this picture of God coming down, handing the law to Moses, Moses giving the law to the children of Israel. But what actually happened is God gave the law to the angels, the angels gave the law to Moses, Moses gave the law to the children of Israel. You see, Stephen, he stood up and said, we received this law by the angels. You understand what Paul says there in Galatians. This, was, this mediator, this came through the angels. Psalm 68 says, the chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. So what was a common understanding to most of us in this room is not a common understanding. We have a picture of God coming, maybe speaking something, saying something, hiding Moses in the cleft of the rock, declaring his goodness, and having his goodness pass by, and then allowing Moses to see that. But understand that part of the glory of the Lord that was shining, that, that had that impact on Moses, was because of the tens of thousands of his angels that were there in the giving of the law. So he is just talking about that momentous time when the law came, it was given by angels. And look at the next verse, verse 20. A mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Basically what he's saying is, listen, you don't mediate, there's not a double mediator. And with the law, there was a double mediator. You had God giving the law to the angels, the angels giving the law to Moses, Moses giving the law to the children of Israel. And God said, no, there's a mediator. Mediator is not from one person to another person to another person. Mediator is between two. And God's one. And so Jesus Christ, we know from Timothy, he is the mediator. It's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so are, are you tracking with me? Are you following what's happening? He's saying, first off, you need to understand that the law was given. The law was given a very specific way. It was given to be a placeholder until the promise was to come. It was given through multiple individuals, not just through a mediator. The mediator is one. So Paul is laying out that there was a purpose for the law, but it wasn't what you think, what most people assume. And here's how you have to get this. In Galatians, so many people will preach Galatians and they will limit legalism. They will limit that to salvation and say, he's just talking about salvation. But remember what Paul says in chapter three. He says, you began in the spirit. Are you now made perfect in the flesh? Paul is not talking to unsaved people about trying to earn their salvation. He is talking both to unsaved people who are trying to earn, but he's also talking to saved people who are trying to please God in the flesh. And he's going to lay it out very clearly for us. It's going to be a shorter message this morning because you you need to get what he's saying. The purpose of this law. Did God tell us to be modest? Did God tell us to be faithful to our wife? Did God tell us not to lie for us just to say, well, Christ saved me, so now I get to do whatever I want to do? No. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No way, Jose. Not in a million years. God forbid. That's not the purpose. So what is the purpose of the law? Glad you asked. See where it says there in verse 19, it was added because of transgressions. It could mean it was added because or it was for the sake of transgressions. Meaning it was added because there were sins or it was added to produce sin. That's why we read Romans 7 this morning because I believe the rest of the Bible teaches that the law reveals sin. Now, Simple illustration of this. What happens when you see a sign that says, don't touch wet paint? All of you are laughing right now. Some of you, why? Because when you go by and you see, you would have walked by that wall, wouldn't have thought a thing about it. But when you see a sign that says, don't touch wet paint, you go, really? (laughs) Why? Why? That is a simple illustration of what Paul is saying. In Romans chapter 4, the Bible says, The law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. 
I have heard people say, man, I, I, had, I had so few problems with this child. I had so few problems with this child. I had so few problems with them. Lord, there, where there's no law, where there's no guidelines, there, there is no transgression. Romans 5, uh, Romans 4, uh, 15 says that. Romans 5 says that, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So, so not only does the law produce sin, and it produces sin by saying, hey, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And because we are sinners, and that wet paint is just an illustration, because we are sinners, when the Bible says don't covet, our sinful flesh says, but I want to. And when the law says don't lie, our sinful flesh says, unless it's better for you, don't lie. And so it actually produces, it, it, it reveals and helps us to understand that there is sin. Look at Romans 7, verse 7. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. If the law didn't tell me to not covet my neighbor's house and my neighbor's wife and my neighbor's car and my neighbor's job, then I could just think that it was just normal for me to want what they have and them not have what they have. But the Bible says, No, that's wrong. That's a sin. So understand the purpose of the law. Number one, it was to reveal sin, but also... It's to multiply sin. Romans 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Look at Romans 7, 5. The Bible says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. You see, laws and guidelines both produce and excite rebellion. Where there's no laws, obviously, there's no rebellion. And there are many times when folks will come up to me and say, Pastor, go forth. Why do we have this rule in the Christian school? I don't see a point in this rule in the Christian school. And there's many times I'll look at them and say, some rules are just there to point out who the rebels are. Because you know what? If you're a rebel and the Christian school has the rule that you can't have, you, that the seventh grade can't go to the water fountain after first hour, then immediately the rebel in seventh grade will go, Wah. they are trying to take away my rights as a human being. They want me to die of thirst in the wasteland. I mean, if it's there, but if you're not a rebel, you look at it, okay, I'm not, I'm not getting a drink of water at the ring fountain after first hour then, I gotta wait till second hour. So I got to prepare. But if you're a rebel, boy, you're out front, you're picketing, you're sneaking to get water, you're coming in with water dripping down on your face if you're really a rebel all over your shirt so people can know that you've been to the drinking fountain, you're walking around going, mm hmm, no lightning struck either. God has spoken, we should have seventh graders at the drinking fountain. And it's the honest truth, it just reveals there is a huge, huge problem when the law comes in and says you can't get what you want. And some of us, at different stages and different places, there are some of God's laws, they don't bother us. There are some of law, God's laws we look at and we go, I like that, that's good, okay. Honor your father and mother, I'm all right with that. Don't lie, okay, all right. Give God some of your hard-earned money, hey now. Not so sure about that one. Consider one another to provoke into love and good works. Ooh, uh, back up a little bit. I don't know about that one. Forgive, and it shall be forgiven you. Well, mm, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I would forgive, but they're really a moron. <laughs> so I don't think it'd be best. And so we come in because it reveals and it multiplies sin. Now, here's what happens. Romans 7, 7, we read you the first part about how it reveals sin. Because I had not known lust except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Look at verse 8. It says, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. There's two things at work that happen when the law comes in. Law reveals our desire to be in charge. You see, when the sign says, don't touch wet paint, that's somebody telling me that I can't touch something. And that drives this inner, well, I've got to touch it. Who are they to tell me? Or are they lying to me? And we'll do all different kinds of things. But not only does it reveal it, but it also wants us to create this idea that, you know what? We're the ones that we can take care of this. So maybe after the fourth or fifth time you've touched wet paint and you realize, you know what? Okay, this is not good for me. I got that paint. It was an oil paint. It ruined my 
most favorite pair of pants. So this isn't beneficial for me to go around touching wet paint, so I need to find a way to stay away from wet paint. So it creates this desire to be in charge, and it creates this desire to self-correct. Okay? So it produces sin, it reveals or multiplies sin, and then number three, Romans 7, 13, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. In other words, God gave us his word to reveal the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Because most folks are only upset with the sin that they don't like. Their own sin, they're fine with. I don't expect you to say, amen. High five your wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're happy with our sin, but that's the way we are. We're happy with our sin. We're happy with what's going on in our life. It's other people's sin that irritate us. It's other people's offenses that irritate us. And so those things, God says, no, 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 you need to be upset with sin because it is sin. And the law helps reveal the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the wickedness of sin. It intensifies it. Now, why is this important? Look back in Galatians 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Now, in your King James Bible, it says God forbid, but that is, there's no word for God in the original, okay? That is where they took the common colloquial term for the most strongestest way that you could say no way. God forbid, okay? There, there is no word for God. It just says, may genoito, it says, may it never be. It could never happen. It, it, that's not it. So is the law against the promises of God? Did God put the law there just to kind of fight against? No, no, no. That is not it. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Get that. If God could have given a law that would have given life, then righteousness could have come by the law. Because every good gift, every perfect gift comes from, from God. So it's not as if God had something he could have done with the law, but he just decided not to. It is impossible. If the law could have been given, it would have been given, but it cannot accomplish life. It is not within its ability to do that. Okay? Verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So why is it? Where is the difference then? Pastor Goforth, I know you've already said and we've already agreed we can't live by lists. We have all of that. But Pastor Goforth, don't we have to teach the next generation what is right and what is wrong? Yes, you have to teach what's right and wrong. That's what the, the law does. That's what the Bible does. It teaches us what's right and wrong. Well, so should we just teach our kids and let them do whatever they should want to do and just let them deal with it? No, there are certain things that you as an individual have to train up how they should go so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. The problem comes from when we look at the law and we look at the list and we look at at the guidelines and we lose the perspective of what it is that it's supposed to do. Follow with me. Romans 8 verse 3 says, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, should we as parents teach our boys and girls, teach our daughters and our sons not to lust? Yes, we should teach them not to lust. However, if we go to the point of saying, all right, here's how we're going to keep them from lusting. We're not going to let them look at anybody that has anything showing beyond or above their elbow or below their knee. We're going to make sure that we surround them with people that are completely covered except for just a small window of their face. And if I see my child, because when we go out in public and if I see them looking, I will jump in between them and say, thou shalt not. You have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why, therefore, should you look upon a maid and turn away? And we will train our child not to look because if they don't look, then they won't lust. You've missed the purpose. God does not say, hey, the way for you to keep from lusting is to not look. Now, should you flee youthful lusts? Should you? What do you think? Very good. Yes, you should flee youthful lusts. You should not hang out with sin. You should avoid being around folks that will corrupt your morals. Yes, the Bible teaches all of those things. But the key is not to have the different things, okay, this is how I'm going to keep my boy 
or my daughter from lusting? Should you teach your children not to be greedy? Yes, but if you break that down saying, okay, so in order to not be greedy, this is what we're going to do. And you make it a list. You're trying to do what the law cannot do. Here's what I'm saying, okay? We struggle with pornography in our culture. Covenant eyes, net nanny, cyber watch, all the rest of it will not keep you pure. Get that. Am I against having a filter on your internet at home? No. But it will not keep you pure. Let me illustrate it a different way. If you were to leave here and go home, who is going to keep you safe? Who's going to keep you alive on that trip home? We're in church, thought this was an easy one. Who's going to keep you safe when you go home this afternoon? God. But are you going to put your seatbelt on? Yes. But are you going to rely on that seatbelt? Better not. I'm going to put it on. I'm going to make sure it's on. If I have a kid that I have to strap into a car seat, I'm going to put them, I'm going to get it strapped in. They've got 40 different things you have to buckle these days. And snap, 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 snap. Get them in. All right. Okay. It's good. But I'm trusting God. It would not occur to any of us as we buckled our baby into the car seat and get the 17th thing in there snapped in to walk around and go, oh, dear, dear Graco. Dear Fisher Price, dear Amazon Essentials, please keep my child safe. Now we get in the car saying, Lord, we need you. Lord, help. And we trust in him because the law could not do it. It was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The weakness, folks, is not the law. The weakness is the flesh. So we're going we're to put up some, some slides to try to help you to, to understand this, because some things I think we get. I want you to see this first slide. This is just, just a little, uh, do we have the pictures there? Okay, that's us. See the, see the boys and the girls? All right. Then there's a plus sign. I know some of you don't like math. You say, Pastor, we're at church. We don't want math. We're not looking for an algebraic answer. This is not, okay. This is just a simple equation. Us plus the law equals what? Rebellion. Are we clear on that? Do we see the law was given to produce sin? And we've looked at how it produces the rebellion. It tells us not to lust immediately, creating within us a desire to want to have. So it reveals the sin. It multiplies the sin. It intensifies that sin. Now, this equation is going to look different in different situations. So let's add some of the things to it. So look, look at the next one, which is us plus the law plus ignorance. Who is this, Pastor? Go forth. This is the person who maybe does not yet have a copy of God's law, but they have rejected the law that God has written on their hearts. Romans 2 says that God writes the law on people's hearts. They see, they understand, they know. Uh, For when the Gentiles, which had not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, they obviously prove that they're a law to themselves. The reason why there are morality, why there are morality, why there is, Why there is morality is not because at some point in time we were evolved creatures who said, you know what, I think it'd be good if we came up with some moral codes to help us live better together. Man, there are folks, there there are all kinds of people trying to, anthropologists trying to figure out when did we start to come up with morality? When did we develop morality? And they do these tests to try to see how uh, other animals think of fairness and things like this. But we're not moral because we evolved at some point in time. We're moral because within each and every person, they know that there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Our culture is trying to remove as much of that as possible. But still, There are people that will say, hey, yes, there are some things that are wrong. And most of the time when I'm talking to someone, they say, well, just because what's wrong for you isn't wrong for everybody. First person I usually bring up is Hitler. So is Hitler wrong for everybody or are some people that good for it? Well, that's different. Well, so there are things that are wrong for everybody. Yeah, I guess so. The reason they know that, maybe they've never read God's law, but in their ignorance... Even though they haven't read the Bible, there still is a law within themselves. So them plus the law within themselves that is ignorance, what does that produce? What do you think that produces? It produces rebellion. What does the rebellion look like? Self-worship. 
well, I know that there's a God, and I know that this God is in control, so I'm going to turn it into a God that I can control. I will never forget going into somebody's house, and they had a picture of Jesus on the wall. And the fellow was getting cussed at by his dad. And the mom got real alarmed, walked over to the wall, and took the picture of Jesus off the wall and put him face down on the table. Didn't want Jesus to hear all that. And I remember as an elementary kid going, well, that's interesting. So Jesus is all powerful except an oak table. He cannot hear. And if you place this picture face down, you cut off all communication. I thought that was weird. And that's what folks who have the law within themselves, they say, you know what? I'm going to create a God that I can be in control of, different things. And so ignorance, it produces rebellion. The rebellion comes out with self-worship. But some people aren't ignorant. Some people know what God's law says, and they choose to disobey it. Now, a person that knows God's law and chooses disobedience. Now, I want you to think about this. Because Paul was writing to the church in Galatia. Within the church, there would have been people who were believers and people who were not believers. So you have to apply this to both sides. So if you go to the ignorant side, well, on the ignorant side, it could be there is somebody who does not know that God's word actually specifically addresses something. And they may think, well, I get to choose. And that's a form of self-worship. So a, a, a new Christian or a Christian who hasn't studied, who has never heard and thinks, well, hey, you know what? The Bible doesn't care if I uh, share with other people the, the wealth that he has given me, or the Bible doesn't care if I'm faithful to my spouse. If they're brand new, they haven't heard anything about that, they may think, well, then I get to decide what I want to do. That's a form of a rebellion that is self-worship. But then there are the, those that come up here that say, okay, you know what? This is a person that says, I know God's law and I choose to be disobedient. This is a little bit easier to figure out. What does this produce? This produces rebellion. What most often does it look like? Self-indulgence. Well, I, I know this, this happens a lot. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many times when husbands and wives first get married and they say, I will never, ever, ever get divorced, that will end up in a counselor's office saying, well, I thought I'd never get divorced, but that was before I realized they did. We're going to do this. I just have to draw the line in the sand. And now I, I just can't do that. I just can't, just can't forgive. Just can't put up with that anymore. And it's self-indulgence. If this crowd is like every other crowd in a church in America on a Sunday morning, fully almost 45% of you struggled with pornography this week. You chose self-indulgence. You know that God's word says not to look after somebody to lust after them. You chose to do it because your body wanted something that you decided to indulge in instead of trusting God's word. You self-indulged. And do you know what you did? You put your fists up and you rebelled. Now, I think we get these. I think we understand this. We understand that if I don't know God's law, that in ignorance I could turn into self-worship. And if I do know God's law, but I willingly and forcefully disobey, that I will be involved in self-indulgence. But this is where we trip. Now let's look at the next one, okay? Let's look at it. This is us, you and I, okay? I don't know if you can tell, but those people up there, they're saved. They're good tithing church members. They are searching out what God's word says. And they find out that God's word says something. And then they say, well, if this is what it says, well, then this is what we have to do. In fact, they'll even talk to other people and say, don't you think we should do this? And they'll try to find a church that agrees with them. This is what we should do. And so they say, hey, here is the obedience. But I want you to see if you can figure out. We're not going to put the results up there yet. Where is the problem in this equation? Let's look at the middle one, that little, that little book. I hope you, did I explain what the book re represents? The law, okay, all right, good. Is there a problem with the law? Well, according to Romans 8, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the, so where's the weakness in this equation? So it's two wonderfully, beautifully saved people on the left. Because those beautifully saved people, though they have been declared just, God has legally, forensically cleared them of all guilt. They are not under the guilt of sin. They are still in the flesh. So that flesh 
plus the law, plus obedience, now what do we get? Rebellion of self-reliance. Rebellion is always going to come with that first equation. It doesn't matter if it's ignorance, obedience, or disobedience. And you need to get that. The Bible teaches us plus the law plus ignorance is rebellion. Us plus the law plus disobedience is rebellion. Us plus the law plus obedience is still rebellion. Now, I have taught this to some folks, and I've heard somebody say, well, you know what? I think I'm just a little bit better rebel being an obeying rebel. So I'll just go ahead and I'll be an obedient rebel and you be a disobedient rebel. You don't find that in the Bible, though. You see, Moses understood that Israel wasn't getting what God's law was supposed to be. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy. It came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take the book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness. For I know thy rebellion, thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, you've been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days. Moses said, I know you're not going to follow in faith. You're going to go off your own way. God knew it too. He sent a promise through Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was a husband to them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So what's the right equation? I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 7, and we're going to put the last equation up, and we're going to be done. Okay, let's put the last equation up, and we'll come back to Romans 7. What does this look like in your life? How are we going to teach our children? How are we going to battle sin? How are we going to see victory in our walk with God? Well, here's what it is, okay? So we're, f we're familiar with the first part. Okay, those first two, those are good, saved individuals. They've come to know the Lord. But this equation works for unsaved individuals as well, if you're in here this morning. You add the law, and you let the law accomplish what it does. And what does it accomplish? It reveals sin. It intensifies sin. And what do I mean by intensifying sin? I mean by making the sin real in our eyes, and we realize how sinful it is. But look what the next addition is. It's not obedience. It's not ignorance. It's not disobedience. What is it? It's Christ. Now look in Romans chapter 7. You'll see this. We're going to skip. Paul, in the first part of Romans 7, right after we read, we read up to verse 12. Right after that, then Paul starts to say, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. There's a war going on in my members. He says, I want to live for the Lord. I want to do right. And look what he says in verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am. Paul, why do you think you're wretched? There are some people, there are some, it blows my mind. There, there are some Bible teachers who read this and say, Paul didn't actually think he was wretched. Yeah, yeah he did. Because he'd been looking at God's word. And guess what God's word had done? It had revealed sin in his life. It had multiplied the sin. It had intensified the sin. And Paul no longer looked at himself and said, I could work on that. I'll never forget when my grandfather was told that he had congestive heart failure and it was going to kill him in months. All of his life. I talked about last week. This was the man that would eat butter with grits. 
that would use salt ham as another vehicle to eat more salt. He never ate healthy in his life. The doctor looked at him and said, you're going to die because you don't eat healthy. All of a sudden, all of those things were revealed, multiplied, and intensified. My grandpa was a mountain of a man. And I told him how, I told my wife what a big guy he was and how strong he was. But I was remembering before he was told he was dying of congestive heart failure. When Day saw him, he was this tiny little old shrunken up, five foot eight little guy. Not the guy who with one hand kept an entire rototiller from falling on his grandson while he kicked him with his feet and said, get up, dummy. He's trying to load it in the back of a van. The boards broke. I fell underneath it. It's about to fall down on me. And grandpa held it up. He was a mountain of a guy. And the doctors told him, Al, you've got to take care of yourself. And he said, okay, pass the salt. <laughs> Al, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got you to lose weight. Okay, I'll just have two Big Macs for lunch. But then when it was multiplied and intensified, he said, wow. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, all of a sudden, it wasn't just, I want salt because it tastes good. It's like, I'd like to live a little bit longer. And now those things had changed in his mind. So this wretched man that I am simply comes because Paul studied God's word. You say, well, this couldn't have been, this must have been early on in Paul's ministry. No, because Paul never quit studying God's word. And as he studied God's word, he realized, oh, no, that, oh, man. But then what did he do? He didn't call up his mission board and say, what should I do? He didn't call up his college and say, what should I do? He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? You know what? Sometimes back in ancient times when somebody murdered somebody, do you know what their punishment would be? They would kill them by strapping the dead body to them and letting it rot and the disease killing that other person. You talk about a horrible death. And there are some people that think maybe that's what Paul was talking about. Who's going to deliver me from this rotten, stinking corpse? Ten Steps for Holy Living by R.C. Spruill. Wisdom from Bob Jones Sr. and How to Live Your Life. You say, well, Pastor, that's not fair because they weren't alive yet. No, but there were other people. But look what Paul says, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now there is no chapter break. Paul goes from, I am such a wicked sinner. And he says, Lord, I need more of you. He runs to Christ. And he goes from what a wretched person I am to chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Some of you have been carrying a weight of condemnation and you have been trying to earn something better with God because you were a terrible kid or a terrible husband or a terrible wife or a terrible something, and you're trying to overcome that by being a better wife, a better husband, a better kid, by being a better student, by doing this, by doing this. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You don't need more rules. You need more Christ. You don't need more guidelines. I'm not saying go home and get rid of net nanny and covenant eyes. Listen, put the seatbelt on, amen? Go ahead and put the seatbelt on. But don't you dare rely on that seatbelt. Don't you dare pray to that seatbelt. And listen, if you were to get into a car, and it's happened, you got into a car and there was no seatbelt, then you have to make a choice. Okay, God, am I really going to trust you or am I not going to trust you? Pastor, go forth. Why would you get in a car without a seatbelt? How many of you have ever been to a third world country? What we call minivans, they call super buses, transporting 17 to 25 people. And you all load in, and then you say, well, then it's safe driving, right? Ooh. No, it's not. It's living by faith. So why did you get in? Because the same Lord is going to protect me there as he's going to protect me inside of a Ford with airbags, side curtain bags, toe curtain bags, knee curtain bags, and all the rest of the curtain bags that it has. It's going to protect me. And if you're not a Ford man, then whoever else you are, don't get offended over that. 
But the thing is, so many folks, pastor, we got to change this. Hey, honey, we got to do this different. We got to start doing this. We got to start doing this. And we got to start doing this. No, no, no. You need more Christ. Who will deliver you? Christ. Draw closer to him. Run to him. Lord, I need you. Some of you are struggling with sin. You've got covenant eyes and you figured out a way to get around it. You've got all the different helps and all the different things. You don't need more tools. You need more Christ. You need to love Christ so much that you're willing to walk into your family and say, I'm struggling with this pornography and I want to get it taken care of. You don't hide, you confess and you forsake. You hide your sins, you don't prosper, but you love God so much you don't care because you want to have fellowship with him. You don't run around trying to fix it yourself. You say, God, I throw myself on your mercy. More of him, more of him, more of him. Because... When you take Christ and you add it to your life that has been heightened and intensified through God's word, the sin, do you know what you get? Let's throw it up there. All the promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Do you know what's included here? Love. Some of you are saying, Pastor Gore, I live in a loveless marriage. You can still live in a fulfilled, loving life with more Jesus. Joy. Well, pastor, if you knew my pain, if you knew the struggles that I went through, you'd know why I didn't like life. You can have joy. You can have peace. You can be gentle. Now, there's some men out there, I'm not gentle. (laughs) No, you can be gentle. Because when you take Christ and add it to you, you keep adding, you can't help but be gentle. I talked last week about Harvey Parks and I watched that gentle man lean over and hand candy to kids with the same hands that took the lives of scores of people. But God redeemed him and changed those hands. You can have love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith. You need more Christ. That's your answer. Pastor, go forth. How am I going to keep my boys pure? More Christ. Pastor, go forth. How am I going to rescue my marriage? More Christ. Pastor, go forth. How how am I going to teach my children how to navigate in this materialistic world? More Christ. More Christ. Draw nigh to him. And what's the promise? You don't have to chase him. You just have to say, Lord, I need you. Matthew, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Quit doing your thing. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Then you'll find rest to your souls. If any man will come unto me, let him deny everything else. Come to me. Pick up your cross. Jesus Christ says, I'm the answer. And he offers everything to you. And Paul says, the law is supposed to drive us to the point where we come running to Christ, just like Paul did. Oh, wretched man that I am. Lord, I need you. That's the answer. Not a list, not a filtering program, not a book, more Christ. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. We're going to have an invitation. Perhaps you're here, and maybe in studying through this, you realize that in your Christian walk, you have tried to reform yourself through your good deeds. You've never come to Christ. You've never placed your faith and trust in him alone. I'd like to invite you this morning to come to Christ. We offer offer an opportunity for you to come to Christ so we can point you to him so you can enjoy his salvation. Or maybe you're here, and you're battling in your marriage and you're thinking, well, if my husband would just do this or this, or if my wife would just do this or this. And you're thinking, if they would just, and you realize, well, no, it's not them. I just need more Christ. It does not matter what your battle is this morning. If you understand that you are a wretched individual, if you understand that the body of sin has destroyed, then come. Lord, I need you. Lord, I don't want a better marriage. I want a 
deeper walk with you. Lord, I don't want better kids. I want a deeper walk with you. Lord, I don't want to have a husband or to have a wife. I want to have a deeper walk with you. Lord, I want you, more of you, more of you. It's invitations for you. I'm going to have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask the piano to play and Brother Dave to sing as the piano plays with the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I encourage you to step out of your seat, come forward. If you can't kneel, I would encourage you to sit there in your seat. Kneel before God and simply tell him, Lord, tell him what's on your heart. That you're tired of trying to work out that equation of the flesh. You want him. Lord, I pray that you'd be this invitation. Direct our hearts. Help us to be obedient to you. May we love you. May we follow you. May we obey you. In Christ's name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, as music plays, you come. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As the piano continues to play, perhaps the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. I would encourage you, don't get used to invitations happening. Don't get used to invitations just being the end of the service. The invitation is the opportunity for you to respond in faith and tell the Lord what you're going to do. Don't think you've accomplished something by agreeing with something that's been said in a message. What is it that you're going to do that you're going to place through grace into your life to become more like Christ? That's what the invitation is for. Always, always understand that we're making a decision, an invitation, whether or not if we come forward to respond in faith. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for meeting with us. I ask that you'd encourage, Lord, those that have been struggling in their walk. Lord, I pray that you would help them as they seek you, Lord, to understand your way. Lord, for those that perhaps are living ignorantly, they don't study your word. They very rarely have that sin revealed or intensified or multiplied in their life. Lord, give them a hunger for your word. That drives out, Lord, the hunger for the things of this world. And Lord, teach them what it is, who it is that you are, and give them a desire for you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Christ's precious name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We do have uh, something special here this morning. Miss Debbie Thomas is coming for uh, membership. Grover, I apologize. You got married, didn't you? Dick, I apologize. I do remember. I was at the wedding. I, was, I remember that, but uh, I apologize, Debbie. Um, but here, if you've never um, I've seen this before, if you're visiting, uh, this is not a biblical requirement. We believe the biblical requirement for church membership is that you know the Lord is your Savior and you're living in obedience. Um, and uh, we believe that part of living in obedience is understanding the need to be baptized. So Basically, the, the biblical requirements that we believe are that you're living in obedience, which the first step would be baptism, but then you wouldn't be under church discipline at any church. But what we do here at Grace is we give folks an opportunity to share their testimony. Instead of just the pastor saying, I talked to Debbie, she's saved, she's been baptized, we're good with her, everybody say amen. Give her a chance to come up and share her testimony with you. So Debbie, if you would come on up here, and she's going to share uh, her testimony, and want you to listen, and then we will vote immediately after that. Good afternoon. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, and I grew up in a non-Christian home. So you kind of get your own beliefs as you're growing up. And I used to believe that I was good enough that I would go to heaven if I were to die, that my good would outweigh my bad, which is a way that I think a lot of people believe. And 
I knew that Jesus was God. I knew that Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. And it was all in my head. And at the age of 18, my best friend, her brother uh, went to the Navy, came back from the Navy, a different person. He came to know Christ while he was away. And through Bible studies at his home, through my best friend, God was working on my heart. And I remember uh, a really important time. I went to a church service and they were having communion. And before communion, the pastor said, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your savior, then we ask that you do not partake. And that was the first time that I had to really come to the realization that I was a sinner and that I was not good enough to make it to heaven. And even as I read God's word where it says, there is none good, no, not one, then I realized that I was lost. And so I remember one night after a Bible study going home and praying and asking the Lord to forgive me and to come into my life and to save me. And he did. And the Lord, you know, even after that, uh, the Lord led me to Bible school for a couple of years. And then in 1981, I met um, my first husband. And he was from the island of Dominica. And so the Lord led us to get married. We moved to Dominica in 1983. And I had the privilege of serving the Lord. Uh, he was the first national pastor of our church. And serving the Lord with him. Uh, for 37 years. And even throughout my life, I have seen God being faithful through especially the difficult times. Um, and, in, and two years ago, the Lord decided to take my husband home uh, after a short illness. And it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to go through. And yet God was faithful. He was always there. And he saw me through. And so I just want to encourage us to, you know, trust the Lord. And I thank the Lord that he has taken me from Dominica and he brought me to Columbia um, and that Dick and I are married and then I have an opportunity to serve him, continue serving him here at Grace. Thank you. Amen. If you're excited to have uh, Debbie on her statement of faith, if you'd say amen. 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 All right, well, let's all stand. Now, Debbie, I forgot to ask you, would you like to um, have folks come by and welcome here? Do you want to, that'd be okay? All right. So if you're okay with that, so we'll have uh, Debbie. Dick, why don't you come on down and stand with her? We'll have one of our deacons uh, come stand with her. It also happens to be her husband. And you can come by and welcome her uh, into the fellowship. And if you're nervous about COVID, you can just walk by six feet away and wave hi. That's fine as well. And so I want to encourage you to come by and welcome her. And thankful that the Lord brought her here to grace. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go. Lord, thank you. We love you. Thank you for meeting with us. Lord, thank you for uh, bringing Debbie here. I pray that you would help us to be an encouragement to her in her walk. Lord, that we would be a blessing and, and strengthening her in her faith as she, she ministers here. Lord, and I pray that you would um, help us to understand exactly how we can do that. And Lord, I pray that you would give her good friends, Lord, and connect her with uh, some of the different ladies here at the church that she can be a blessing to as well. Now, Lord, go with us as we go our separate ways. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. We love you. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.